So this is just a, a run through the kinds of data that uh, exist and that we need and more data we will need. We will hardly be uh, comprehensive in this uh, chapter in terms of the data because as you go along you will see the kind of processes that are involved in climate science, weather and climate, uh, kind of data that is needed for predictions which we already looked at in terms of weather prediction and climate prediction. Um, and global warming brings a whole host of other issues and monitoring the cryosphere uh, or the frozen parts of the uh, uh, planet, uh, water, uh, permafrost and so on are uh, also very critical. So these are some examples we will look at. We are looking at uh, Greenland and uh, the Arctic sea ice here. So Arctic sea ice extent in September 1979 and 2020 from satellite observations. So you can see that uh, the purple line is the median ice extent from 1981 uh, to 2010 and the uh, recent data for 2020 has uh, shrunk quite a bit compared to the median data over this whole period. In 1979 the ice extent was 7.1 million square kilometers. In 2020 it was 3.9 uh, million square kilometers. So uh, obviously uh, it was greater than the median and now it's much less than the median and this doesn't even tell you um, the thickness changes. So there is the concept of ice extent and ice volume, uh, so you can think of uh, uh, these Swiss cheese kind of uh, regions where ice is not continuous. So if you look at just ice area, then you have to take out the holes, for example. And ice extent is just uh, this kind of things where there is uh, some uh, level of ice. Okay, so even when you look at glaciers on Greenland, not just sea ice, um, the thickness can change uh, so the satellite image doesn't necessarily give you the picture of how the thickness or the mass of the glacier is changing. And the same for uh, goes for sea ice. Uh, just because it's white everywhere doesn't mean the sea ice thickness is the same everywhere, right? So those details are also very hard to measure uh, from space or even in situ and there are many many platforms that are being used to do that. Uh, and given all those difficulties, uh, we are looking here at changes in late summer sea ice extent in the Arctic and Antarctic and global monthly sea ice extent uh, uh, in the center. So we will look at three uh, panels here. So let's start with the uh, Arctic here. So northern hemisphere uh, sea ice, this is going uh, for September uh, 1979 to 2020. Uh, so you always look at September extent. Why? Because that's the end of the northern summer and whatever ice that is remaining at the end of the summer ice will begin to refreeze and grow uh, during uh, fall and winter months unless global warming comes and extends the melting season beyond September which is happening already. So those are the kind of things you have to worry about. And we are looking here at the decadal trend. As we said, we take uh, the extent here and the extent here and divide it by the time. So this is uh, minus 12.79% is the change per decade. So that's minus uh, 0.82 million square kilometers. Uh, that is reduction of 0.82 million square kilometers. Uh, over a decade, over each decade. So here is the average 1981 uh, to 2010 that we looked at in the previous figure, the median. Uh, so sorry, this is the average 6.41 square kilometers and there is the trend line. Again, you have uh, year to year variabilities which are related to uh, various uh, phenomenon including forcings from the tropics like El Nino can send a wave which can bring heat to the Arctic and create ice melts. La Nina can uh, increase the ice extent in a given year and so on. So the year to year and there are also a lot of local circulation changes. Arctic has uh, very complicated connections to the Pacific, Atlantic and Labrador seas here. Um, so there are lots of 
uh, heat that is being brought in and taken out, all those things together decide the sea ice formation, its extent, its thickness, and so on and so forth, which we will get into some detail uh, later on. So that gives you a sense of how uh, the area has changed. Uh, okay, um, let's see. Uh, here we are looking at uh, globe sea ice. So this is, remember here we are looking at uh, Arctic, Antarctic and uh, global. Uh, so this is global. I might have switched it around, so sorry. So let's look at Southern Hemisphere sea ice first. Southern Hemisphere remains a complicated story. So here the cadal trend for the overall Southern Hemisphere is positive. So plus 1.74%, a tiny bit. So 0 0.07 million square kilometer per decade. Uh, for We are obviously looking at Southern Hemisphere uh, end of summer, which is March. So we are looking at month of March for 1979 to uh, 2020. So the 1981 to 2020 average here is 4.03 million square kilometers and you can see a slight bit of uh, ra rise in the total coverage of sea ice and the larger, uh, somewhat larger year-to-year uh, uh, -year variabilities. Okay, so why is the Southern Ocean having a positive trend? We will see later on that actually the Southern Ocean, which completely surrounds the Antarctic uh, continent, uh, has a very unique circulation. Uh, if you imagine winds forcing the oceans uh, in the Atlantic, Pacific and Indian Oceans, um, you hit continents on both sides. So that tends to prevent the amount of energy that the winds can put into the ocean. So winds begin to drag the ocean and then they hit the continent so they cannot drag it anymore. Whereas the Southern Ocean behaves differently. So for that reason there are complicated uh, uh, issues that if the ocean warms, uh, atmosphere can warm and hold more moisture and uh, create uh, more snow on Antarctica and uh, Antarctic uh, glaciers can f flow onto the ocean from shelf ice and then create conditions that are different for the southern hemisphere sea ice. So you also remember from the global warming chart that the temperature changes over the southern ocean are complicated. So there are some places where it's negative, some places <coughs> excuse me, it's positive as opposed to the Arctic where it's not only positive but it's uh, the largest warming uh, over the whole globe which we call the polar amplification. Okay, so if you look then at the global sea ice, uh, not just over the Arctic and Antarctic, uh, then the average is over here at 23.25 million square kilometers. <coughs> Uh, decadal trend for the global sea ice is minus 2.19% uh, and minus, point f uh, f minus 0 0.51 million square kilometers. So overall uh, the uh, sea ice volume over the globe is decreasing and that matters because as we said uh, the uh, reflectivity of the sea ice is much higher than the land as you can see. Darker spaces of the ocean and uh, land absorb more of the solar energy uh, than the uh, sea ice and glaciers. So if sea ice melts away, for example here, it has gone from being very bright to very dark. So you are keeping more and more of the sun's energy. So you are obviously amplifying the warming as we said before. So reducing global sea ice is going to then overall reduce the reflectivity of Earth's surface and going to add to uh, global warming. There is also cryospheric data from mountain glaciers. Glaciers uh, flow as we will see later. Uh, ice is sea ice is frozen water. The process is very different than glacier. Glacier is snow that falls. Uh, it doesn't melt through one year so more snow falls on top. Because of the weight it begins to get compressed and becomes uh, 
a form of ice and it's different than frozen ice because this is uh, uh, flows like a molasses it's uh, uh, it's got a rheology as you uh, as we call it so when it's on a mountain slope it can flow down the slopes and go on to the ocean become shelf ice and so on and so forth uh, and you can also see there is uh, it's not as white as uh, the uh, other ice we saw before a lot of dust can get deposited um, and if uh, reflectivity is reduced again that could increase the melting rate because you're absorbing more energy <coughs> If it melts and forms a pond, then that pond also is darker so it can absorb more energy. So all kinds of interesting processes happen. You can kind of see here the changes. There is maybe a crack in the uh, glacier here. Maybe there is water there, but it's brighter over here and so on and so forth. So all these details have to be observed and you have also glacier lakes. This is the Muir uh, 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 Glacier in Glacier Bay National Park and Preserve in Alaska. The picture on top is from 1941. That on the bottom, uh, this is from 1941. This is from 2004. So you can see the same exact place the glacier remains here but all this glacier has melted away and now it's much darker than uh, here so it means it's continuing to absorb more and more energy okay so these are the kind of observations you need and lots of details of how the glacier thickness is changing its flow rate is changing its so-called grounding line is changing I don't want to um, use too many technical words that we haven't explained but you can understand that when the glacier is growing on a mountain it has a point where it's anchored and then it's flowing ahead of it and there is some kind of an equilibrium there is an equilibrium line where the amount of accumulation and the amount of melting or uh, accretion and ablation are equal to each other so that equilibrium line can keep moving up the mountain when the glacier melts which is, which is what has happened here for example glacier has melted and the equilibrium line has moved uh, here by 2004 okay um, just to add a little bit more these are cumulative mass changes in uh, water equivalent uh, meters of water equivalent or thousand kilograms per meter squared so when it melts you you look at water equivalent so cumulative mass balance in meters water equivalent uh, of mountain glaciers across the world uh, from Scandinavia Canada Caucasus Alaska to uh, Arctic uh, Canadian region Asian central region and so on and of course there is bad news all of them ha are tending downward at different rates for example Western Canada and US is crashing at quite a fast rate this one has become faster more recently the central European one there are some that are still going slower uh, but the bad news is all of them are uh, losing uh, mass okay and this is the cumulative mass balance of Greenland and Antarctica for 1992 to 2020 you can see this is cumulative change in mass billion metric tons uh, billions of metric tons of glaciers so Antarctica combined data Antarctica the, from just the, uh, one of the data sets Greenland so there are multiple data sets being used but obvi obviously news is again uh, quite bad so we are talking about glaciers before we talked about sea ice so we have to separate uh, the processes the data the uh, impacts on them the changes in them and so on and so forth so this is the kind of uh, a, a green uh, the data that's collected uh, people go there and collect data navies collect data from the bottom as well as from the top aircrafts uh, satellites uh, and people even go and put bamboo sticks in the Himalayas and see year-to-year uh, -year changes and so on so these are the ice sheets we mentioned ice sheets here somewhere without saying what ice sheets are so just to make sure an ice sheet is a mass of glacier glacial land ice extending more than 50,000 square kilometers or 20,000 square miles the two ice sheets on earth today cover most of Greenland and Antarctica during the last ice age ice sheets also covered much of North America and Scandinavia so if you heard of the last ice age which ended about 12,000 years ago 
uh, ice sheets had come all the way down to uh, Long Island or New York, for example, and down into uh, uh, Europe, uh, all the way down into uh, uh, Scandinavia and uh, so on. So these are where the ice sheets uh, uh, exist, and that's just the definition in terms of uh, the area. Okay, so we will come back and look at other data in terms of ocean, because we said glaciers are melting. Where does all the melted glacier water go? that's going to go into the oceans and raise the sea level. So sea ice, which is in the ocean, already melts. It doesn't raise sea level because it's like ice cube melting in your glass. Whereas water that has been moved from the ocean onto land and stored as glaciers, and glaciers melt, all that water that is coming back into the ocean is going to change the volume and the sea level of the ice, uh, of the ocean. Okay.